I'm, now we're going to switch gears completely in a different way, and we're going to talk more about survival in these times, in these tough economic times. This is a very uh, uncertain future. There's an uncertain future for a lot of folks right now, many people who may be laid off or wanting to reinvent themselves because uh, their jobs may be downsized, that type of thing. And my next guest has some advice and some insights as to what you can do to make a difference so that you are not blindsided by a change in fortunes or a reversal of fortunes. He's here to talk more about this. His name is Lamar Smith, and he's written this new book called There's More to Life Than the Corner Office, and it's a great read. It's the secret to total life prosperity, and I find it very interesting that you really believe that there's a way, I mean, we always hear about people saying, you know, make the best out of a bad situation. When one door closes, another opens. But what is it about your insight, your particular method that's really going to set you apart and give people some practical advice to move forward in their lives? It's all about the inner voice. It's what goes on uh, between our ears and uh, in our hearts. Uh, that's where the battle of our life really is uh, won or lost. That's where it's fought. And even when bad things happen, even when you get laid off, when you're disadvantaged, your response to it is probably more important than what happens in your life. And you can always choose your response. You can always choose your response. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know right. that they have that choice, that That's it is true. a choice that you can choose how to respond, how to react to the, to the crisis of the moment. So how do you get people to focus and think about what that inner voice is telling them? Well, first of all, if you're using words like he or she or they, then <clears throat> you're giving away your power. Uh, the things that are coming down the pike that other people are doing that is messing up your life, uh, you're, you've got your focus outward. And uh, you've got very little chance to uh, change other people. So uh, it's much more productive to focus, well, what can I do? Even given this circumstance, I have choices that I can make. And you only have to live in the moment. You don't have to worry about the past. You don't have to worry about the future. You just have, have today. There's always something you can do. Figure out what that is and do it today. You say that be honest with yourself about what you might have to do to survive, including taking a job or jobs that are, quote, below your qualifications. Take a job just to get through this. So mm -hmm. don't see it as a long-term proposition. This is something just to keep the cash flow going. There is honor in any work done well. And so there is no dishonorable work so long as you're serving other people and you're, you're doing a good job. But a lot of people have a hard time, you know, accepting that. People who are bankers, investment counselors, people who have had six-figure incomes who now, you know, are having to think uh, about standing in line to, uh, with a, a number of other applicants for the small, few jobs that might be available in their particular field. Certainly. Uh, but then that's a matter of choice. That's a matter of choice again, right? Exactly. Why did you write this book? Why did you? What got you to, to focus and really engage in this discussion? Well, I'm an old Air Force pilot, and I, I started in the uh, early years of my life uh, taking a look at the processes I was using to do the maneuvers because I became an instructor pilot, uh -huh. and I was teaching students how to do it. And I could do the maneuvers and, uh, and the procedures, but I had not really looked at my own uh, processes for doing that. So I started looking at those processes that I was using so that I could impart them and teach them. You do this, then you do that. And I carried that over to the rest of my life, and I started analyzing those processes. So then I spent 30 years in the corporate environment analyzing processes that worked, and particularly those that didn't. Uh, and um, when I uh, left the corporate office at age 60, it was time to do something else, I said, well, I don't want to die with my music in me. How do I uh, pass this on? So, uh, so you've taken the, the depth of your result. knowledge that you've accumulated over the last three decades, and basically, and plus your your life as a pilot, and incorporated it into this book. And how do you know that it's it's? I mean, obviously it's worked for you, but how do you know that people are going to come away feeling that they can do it too, that they can do it too? How, what is it that you're trying to communicate with them to to bridge that gap? Well, the the principles are not all that terribly exotic. Um, but the way, that, uh, the, the way that they're deployed in the life, uh, this is a parable. It's a story. A young man who is really sold out to his career gets on an airplane. He's uh, seated next to a passenger that is an older man. He, he discounts him. He doesn't realize that he's a CEO of, of one of Boston's realize. largest right. firms. Yeah. And <clears throat> um, so uh, the conversation uh, takes place between the two of them in such a way that the older man starts to mentor the younger man. They grow a relationship. And uh, it, it makes it a pretty easy read, and it, the, the uh, lessons 
uh, come pretty easily. But um, no, please go ahead. I was just going to. I was looking at our, our emails because we're getting a few emails, and I want to get to those in just a second. Okay, good. Um, when you say live in the moment, don't focus on what you have to manage in 90 days, one year from now. Focus on what positive steps you can make today. That's very difficult, for example, if you're having to, you know, be the main breadwinner for your family, for example. You know, well, certainly. You have to pay the bills, you've got to pay the mortgage. So how do you live in the moment given those obligations? Well, again, you don't have to worry about the next 10 years and what this, you, you just have to get through today. If you are out of work and the bills are mounting up, then you've got to look at what you can do and do that today. Uh, there is always one more thing you can do. Hal Moore, a general in the Army, taught us that in the movie that Mel Gibson made, We Were Soldiers, once. Uh, there's always one more thing you can do, even in the midst of combat when things are not going your way. Find what that is and do it, instead of uh, having it vapor lock you with, with fear. As a matter of fact, that is the, uh, that, that's what's going on in America today, and it's kind of interesting. I wrote this book last spring and summer before the financial crisis hit. And it's taken on a little bit of a different character now. Um, what I'm uh, hearing is that uh, a whole lot of people are concerned about America and the future of the American dream. And the, uh, the, the processes in this book and, and the message here, I think, really fits this time. People are saying, well, gee, uh, America really uh, means a lot, and now it's very much in question as to where, Do you think whether it's so our possible children... to find the American dream. In, Absolutely in it is. In today's culture, in today's times? Absolutely it is. But the American people need to step forward. We are a, a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it's not for the government or the schools or somebody else. It's for us as individuals. Take individual personal responsibility exactly. for the future. And there's probably, there probably about 40% of us or something like that that really understand the American dream and, uh, and are willing to do something about it. Um, too many people think that uh, America the free means free ride. It doesn't. It means freedom for individual, uh, the individual, and, f and responsibility is the other side of that coin. How do you do that when, you know, there's generations of young people today, for example, growing up without that notion of individual or personal responsibility, that they've seen their parents or maybe even their grandparents being able to manage with government handouts? Well, that's what my generation is not doing, and that is teaching those young people. And what I think that we should do is everybody ought to buy this book. Absolutely. <laughs> there's more to because... life than the corner office. You've got to go buy it, folks. Absolutely. I think because it does model the mentoring relationship, and it is a pump primer for significant conversations with peers and with younger people to, uh, to get them back to this notion that has made America great, and that's individual freedom and individual responsibility, fiscal responsibility, ethical behavior, doing the right thing, working hard, not spending money we don't have, things that are pretty foreign to many Americans today. Do you, and you, I think you probably believe that it's never, you're never too old to have a mentor, especially if you're right. in a situation where you, you're facing some tough times on certain future and being able to partner with somebody who might be able to teach you something. Absolutely. Even, well, when, that you might not even realize that you're capable, you know, mm -hmm. looking at uh, things that you might be capable of doing. You know what I'm noticing <clears throat> as I go through life is that there are more and more younger people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And uh, when, when I go to a doctor, I'm a lot less concerned with his age than his competency mm -hmm. or her competency. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the, the idea is that we, we need to learn from each other. <clears throat> and I'll go where the expertise is. Uh, and, uh, and, and when I'm in my 80s, I hope I'm still learning. Well, there's a lot, the baby boomers, though, for, for the most part, I mean, they're going to live longer and they're, go they're going to be out there. And, yes, we are. And the fact, is, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, you know, 60, 65 at retirement doesn't mean anything anymore because a lot of people still have to work. Yep. Uh, their, you know, retirement funds, of course, are being challenged with, this, with, these econ you know, with the current economy and everything.